they're not able to be here, but uh, we uh, hope that uh, spring will come uh, very soon and uh, they'll be able to worship with us at each of the services. But we would like to welcome each of you here. Uh, our my, uh, topic this morning, this evening, is Psalms 107-19. And it's a praise to God for deliverance. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Let the redeem of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from the hand of the enemy, and gather them out of the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. They wandered in the wilderness in a solitary way. They found no city to dwell in. Hungry and thirst, their soul fainted in them. Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them out of their distresses. And he led them forth by the right way that they might go to a city of habitation. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works for the children of men. And he satisfies the longing soul and fills the hungry soul with God. Goodness. Amen. And we praise the Lord Amen. for the word of God. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we do thank you for this day. We thank you for those that have turned out, Lord, for this special occasion as we do the adoration of Brother Paul for Deacon, Lord. And Lord, we just ask that each one of us uh, instill in our hearts that uh, we want to do the things that the Lord would have us to do. And Father, we just ask that, uh, that you just be with us this evening. For with us in Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 <clears throat> amen. Amen. And my brother called me yesterday, Mr. Billy. He says, hey, uh, I got one song for tomorrow night. Uh, brother Joe gave, provided that one, I believe. And yeah, that's going to be the end one. He says, what are we going to do next for the first one? I'm like, ow. Oh. <laughs> uh, but, but I thought about it and pulled up my stuff and looked through it a little bit. And uh, the one I came up with was uh, In the Garden because... I see or feel, and I've be, been there once before, sometimes you're going to be there alone with yourself, without Mr. Neva, uh, to go over things and affairs of the, of the church that he may not be able to spread out to everybody, just to be between you and Brother Bill and Brother Carnell. So uh, I know those days are coming. So this in the garden, I think, will fit in perfectly for tonight. Uh, you can please stand and join in with us. <laughs> Oh 
his name to uh, come before uh, the body to be approved and I do not know who that one person was but uh, we had our council meeting it's been several weeks ago on a Tuesday and at that time we voted together to approve uh, Carnell not Carnell excuse me Joan for deacon and so on Wednesday night, the following day, the, uh, we talked to the church and we told them uh, that Brother Paul had been selected as our, uh, deacon. And uh, so we then told them that we were going to have a meeting on Sunday. And at that time, everyone would vote for Paul, for Paul or not to vote for Paul. Well, would you believe that that the vote was unanimous mm -hmm. for Paul. Mm -hmm. So that's that's a great start for you, Brother Paul. Mm -hmm. So I just want to let you know what our procedure was. <clears throat> Good evening. Good evening. Typical Baptist Church, I see. All the folks sitting all the way back there, <laughs> all these empty seats all the way up here, uh, and I think I'm supposed to be uh, turned on here, and maybe you're because you're recording, not because necessarily uh, I couldn't speak loud enough for you to be able to hear me, uh, but anyway, we'll um, do this. Uh, I'm going to bring uh, a message, uh, which I have uh, prepared for this evening, um, not just uh, a little devotional. So um, I would invite you to um, turn in your scriptures, and we'll spend a few minutes together with the message, and then we will proceed from there uh, with the laying on of hands uh, and the official ordination in that regard. Uh, turn with me, if you will, to begin with, to the book of Acts and the second chapter. <clears throat> Let me say I'm uh, grateful for the opportunity to be a part of the process. Thank you for letting me uh, do that and to be able to come and share with your message this evening and then to um, participate in the laying on of hands as well. And um, we're grateful for the privilege and grateful that God is moving, is alive, and is well, and is working in this church Amen. Uh, to bring this event together for this evening. In the second chapter of Acts, we have this giving of God's Holy Spirit in a new and different kind of way by God himself, and it's actually given to what becomes the church. 
And we find the Apostle Peter, who uh, is inspired by the Holy Spirit, and we find him in the second chapter, giving, beginning at verse 14, this great sermon at what we call Pentecost, or the coming and giving of the Holy Spirit. He gives this great message, and then uh, skipping over all of that, because we could spend all night in studying this wonderful passage of Scripture, let's pick it up at verse 40. And 40 and 41 says, And with many other words, he, that is Peter, bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. If you will, this is kind of the beginning of the church. Uh, that is to say, those who, in a very broad sense, came to know Christ and individually, and those larger numbers came, then we find that these people assembling together after that uh, are the church and the outworkings of God's Holy Spirit through the church. So now let's look at verses 42 through 47. And they, devote they, that is all of those individuals who had come to know the Lord and who are now kind of gathered together as a church, as an assembly, as a gathering, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And I'm reading from English Standard Version, by the way, if it doesn't look exactly like you have. And all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. The Apostle Peter, with the power of the Holy Spirit, preached on the basis of what he had come to know as his own personal conviction. And we find that recorded in Matthew 16, where when Jesus said, who do people say that I am? And remember that he talked to a subset with some of the prophets or whatever. But Peter said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, on this rock, you're Peter, and on this rock, I will build my church. On the rock, I believe, of his conviction and of his statement that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And on that basis, Jesus said, I will build my church. And then we find that Peter, in that power, based on his conviction and under the Holy Spirit, preaches this great message. These people come to know him. And gathering together them, they attend to the apostles' teaching, to worship and to fellowship and to distributing amongst themselves to care for each other. And so we begin to realize that the first and most important element for a church, and I want to speak a little bit to you as the church, uh, uh, being a healthy church, is that we first of all have to have that same conviction that Peter had. Ken McKinley, the pastor of First Baptist Church in Sharon, o Sharon Oklahoma said it like this, a great church is one where the people's hearts are set on Jesus. It's one where their affections are set on Jesus. Where their dreams are set on Jesus. Where their minds and wills are what? Set on Jesus. Yes. That conviction, Jesus is the Christ. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And we focus on Jesus. And we focus on his great sacrifice for us that enables us to become one together under him and in Christ and in God. And we gather together to worship, to honor, to glorify, to exalt Jesus Christ. And in that sense, the Godhead, Jesus as the Son of God, but also God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. We worship together, and so the first mark of a healthy church is that based on its conviction, it's going to gather together in worship. Healthy churches gather to worship him who is the object and the subject of their worship. Amen. God, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. 
A healthy church gathers to worship. Inspiring, engaging, passionate, sincere, empowering worship. To tend to the uncompromising teaching of God's word, we, we saw in Acts 2. They gathered for the apostles' teaching, and they attended to that. They gave their attention to that. An uncompromising teaching of the word of God and the gospel of Jesus. A healthy church in worship draws people into a closer relationship with God and with Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit, in a healing, forgiving, therapeutic discipline from the Holy Spirit upon the people of God as they gather to worship Him. And so too, not only do we gather to worship, but we also gather to fellowship because we have to ask ourselves, if we're going to come together as God's people, what's involved in that? Yes, we have to worship, but we also have to fellowship with one another. Remember the Apostle Paul said, How shall people call on him for salvation in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear of him without a preacher? And how can there be a preacher except that they be sent? The people have to gather together in fellowship and to worship. And they have to have a preacher to preach to them. But then as they fellowship together, they are going to tend to the word. They're going to grow in that fellowship with one another. And then they're going to move beyond that out to do his work. But it starts as the people gather in fellowship, like-minded believers gathering in his name. How many times have we heard it said, perhaps maybe even you have this conversation with folks, when they say you don't have to go to church to be a Christian. You don't have to go to church to be a Christian. Well, in some technical sense, I guess that's true. And you can probably go to the Bible and you can pick out verses here and there. And in a proof text methodology, you could probably make a case for that. But I want to ask you, if the way a person becomes a Christian is by repenting of their sin, of rebellion against God, and their sin of committing these atrocities against the will of God, and they commit themselves by repenting to following the will of God and accepting Jesus as their Savior of Lord and Lord. And they commit themselves to walking in the light, what? As he is in the light. And if Christ died to establish his church and told Peter, upon the confession that you've made, I, that I am the Christ, I will build my church. And if Jesus saved Saul and made him Paul and led him all over the known world to establish churches, and if the church is the bride of Christ, then how can one who calls himself or herself a Christian say to Jesus, I don't want to be in fellowship with your bride. I don't believe in organized religion that is your church. I don't have to go to church to be a Christian. Dear friends, I would say to you on the basis of the entire Bible, and especially the entire New Testament, and some of those few things that I just laid out for you, this is not a defensible position. If we call ourselves a Christian, we need to be in church. We need to be in fellowship with Him. That's what God's Word teaches us to do. So we need to worship and we need to fellowship, but also we need to be involved in discipleship. Discipleship is another mark of a healthy church. We are to be disciples who make disciples. And that is that we need to be about discipleship, religious education, Sunday school, holistic small groups maybe, or prayer groups, learning, growing, practicing spiritual disciplines, modeling servant leadership, promoting discipleship amongst ourselves, and helping each other to grow spiritually. All of these things are a part of discipleship. As we gather around each other, we put our arms around each other, we sit in small groups, we sit in Bible study, and we share with each other what it means to be disciplined by God's Holy Spirit. And we disciple each other as God's Spirit disciples us. And as we put ourselves in places where we can lead in discipleship and where we can also follow in discipleship until we're able to grow to the point where we can lead in discipleship. And then disciples making disciples making disciples is how the church grows. Jesus said, I will build my church. And it's always going to be here. 
This church may not always be here. A lot of the churches in the New Testament aren't still in existence either. And we know that many churches closed their doors, perhaps 4,000 across the United States. 900 of those Southern Baptists closed their doors every year. So not every church will live, but Christ's church will live, and we will live too if we commit ourselves to being a healthy church. So we gather to worship and fellowship and to disciple one another and make disciples that make disciples so that each and every one of us is following that great church principle of gathering to worship and to make disciples. But a part of being an effective disciple, and that which flows from discipleship, has to do with what happens in the daily activities and the work of the church, and this we call ministry and mission. So we gather to worship and to fellowship. We disciple one, one another, and then we do the ministries of the church because if we're following him and we've committed ourselves to him and we're discipling each other, we're not going to be satisfied with just sitting around discipling one another because discipling means being active about his work, doing that which he's called us to do. And he's called us to care for the orphans and for the widows and for those who are, in, who are sick and in prison and who are naked, those who have needs. And we look around us and we see the needs of the people in the church and outside of the church. And we realize that we need to be about doing that work. And that's the work of ministry and missions. And so the work that we do within the church are ministries. And we carry those ministries outside in mission work. They, they're still ministries, but outside the church is kind of exercising that mission effort as we reach out to help other people. So we find that we're going to be involved in ministry and missions if we're going to be a healthy church. A healthy church that doesn't do anything except minister to itself through Sunday school classes or whatever is going to become ingrown and it's not going to be a healthy church. Anything that begins to grow in upon itself is eventually going to die. So this work of ministry has to reach outside. And so finally, as we think about those outside the church, we have to be about evangelism. So a healthy church is not only going to be involved in worship and in discipling and in gathering in fellowship and in doing ministry and missions, it's also going to be involved in evangelism. That is to say, we realize that there are people outside the church who not only have physical needs to be met, but those are good for now, but not for eternity. And so they have spiritual needs that are going to have to be met. And the only way we can do that first is to win them into a relationship with God through his son, Jesus Christ. And that's evangelism. And so we are concerned not just about people's physical needs, but also their spiritual needs. And not just for now, but for eternity. And so we're concerned that they would come into a relationship with love. Sometimes people feel like, well, you just want to befriend me so that uh, you can make me a Christian. Well, it kind of goes hand in hand, doesn't it? We want to befriend you. We want to love you. But we want to love you with a love that you will know is for your eternal life, not just for this life. And so we want to share Christ with you because... We want to befriend you and we want to love you. And we're not loving you if we're not sharing with you about that which will give you eternal life. And so we are driven, driven from our relation to our relationship with the Lord to gather together to worship and to fellowship and to disciple one another that we might make more disciples by doing ministry and missions and evangelizing that people will come to know the Lord. So we bring them into a relationship with the Lord and then we disciple them so they can be a part of the church. A healthy church needs to be involved in doing all of those things and to do those actively and vibrantly. We have to have a pastor or a minister and I know you're in search of a new pastor. Bless Brother Mike for the years that he gave you. Amen. And uh, we're... I understand he's back teaching now, right? Back, back in school. 
So hopefully he's on the mend, and hopefully what he had done will, will mean that he doesn't have to face that anymore. Okay. So we do thank him and we bless him. But you are in a situation where you'll be looking for God's next servant to come and to serve you as your pastor. But the work of the church and all of those things that we've talked about that are the marks of a healthy church cannot be done just by your pastor. It needs the people of the church. And he needs those who have stepped up, who have felt the calling upon God, and the church has approved, that is to say he's been tested, and the church has approved him to be a deacon in the church, to be able to work alongside the pastor, to help in the leadership and in the ministries of the church, to assist in the functions of a healthy church. And so we look at Acts 6 and we realize... You just turn over a page, perhaps from where you were, page or two. We realize that in the days when the disciples were increasing in number, it says in 6, in verse 1, that a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. So we realize some problems began to develop in the church, the gathering of the people, and the disciples, the apostles said amongst the disciples, we need some help to resolve these issues and to minister to these needs. And so we find what they said pleased the whole gathering, and they chose Stephen, verse 5, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, and a proselyte of Antioch. Verse 6, these they set before the apostles, and they prayed and laid their hands on them. And so we have this biblical foundation for the raising up of servants to work alongside the apostles so that the work of the church could be carried out. And these men were elected, laid hands on, ordained, if you will, to this ministry. Not just anybody, though, is qualified to be a deacon. We would hope that everyone could move toward being qualified to be a deacon. But God's word spells out for us some things. So I'm looking now at 1 Timothy 3, if you wanted to move over there briefly. Because I know it's kind of like, remember that story of the, of the farmer who showed up to uh, feed all of his cattle? And there were only one, one or two there. And uh, he gave them just what they needed. Well, that, that farmer one day went to church and the pastor had just droned on and on and on to just a few people. And at the door, this farmer went out and he said, well, pastor, he said, when I show up in the field and there are only a couple of cattle and not the whole herd there, I don't give them the whole load of hay. <laughs> uh, well, I'm trying to not give you the whole load of hay. All right, I'm trying to abbreviate this as much as I can because we aren't many. Uh, tonight, but you deserve God's word just as much as if there were more here tonight. So we don't want to short that either. But we find in 1 Timothy 3 some qualifications for deacons. It says deacons must be dignified, not double-tongued, not addicted to much wine, not greedy for dishonest gain. They must hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. And let them also be tested first. Then let them serve as deacons if they prove themselves blameless. Their wives likewise must be dignified, not slanderers, but sober-minded, faithful in all things. Let deacons each be the husband of one wife, managing their children and their households well. For those who serve as deacons gain a good standing for themselves and also great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. Brother Henry Webb has written a book, Deacons, Servant Models in the Church, and we're going to give a copy of this to our newly ordained deacon this evening. Uh, but in this book, Brother Webb shares some very important concepts, and there's a lot of great details there. But his primary premise is that the primary role of a deacon is to be a model, is to model attributes for the church. Certainly the pastor has that role as well, 
but the deacon alongside the pastor is to model attributes for the church. And we see these attributes listed for us here. I'm not going to go get in detail about all of these, but let me just kind of put some different words on them, if you will, to some degree. Brother Paul, as a deacon, you need to model for the church as you are serving alongside the pastor to help the church be a healthy church in those marks that we talked about. Model these attributes. Dignity. How are you dignified? There are lots of ways not to be dignified. I think we can think about those. And so when we are acting in a way that's dignified, not in a demeaning way to the, to the very nature of Christ and what it means to be a Christian, we are modeling dignity. We are standing up for what it is that Jesus stands up for. And as we are dignified in modeling Christ himself, then we are modeling that dignity for the church. Honesty. So when we say something to people, we follow through on that. When we say to an individual, we're going to do this for you, one, one of the persons that we're ministering to in the congregation, then we follow through on that to do that. And we quite often, uh, it's very easy to say something, I'll pray for you, I'll do this, I'll do that, but we don't follow through on that. And when we are honest, we keep our word to folks. And it's kind of that thing of people don't care how much we say, we care, but what they really care about is when we show how much we care. Right. And we do that when we follow through honestly with what we've said. And of course, there are a lot of ways in the church where the deacons can be dishonest when it comes to handling some of the funds or some of the, the paperwork, some of the administration, those kind of things. It's easy to fudge, but the deacon needs to model honesty for the church. And sobriety in terms of not being a person of much wine, okay? uh, sobriety. Uh, and there's a whole thing about being sober-minded. We talk about the Apostle Paul over the book of Romans. Okay? Um, it has to do with, with the mentality, how we're approaching life, a temperate kind of way of doing that, okay? so that we are modeling sobriety, not just a matter of not being drunken or not being gluttonous, okay? but also modeling that sense of sobriety in our way of thinking, in our way of behaving, in our way of modeling, again, the role and the purpose and the function and the dignity of Christ himself to the church. And there needs to be humility, humility, so that we are our servants. By being a model, we set ourselves to be a servant for the church. And so it is that in humility we serve the church, not to be served by the church, not to set ourselves up over the church, not to lord it over the church, but in humility to serve the church. And we need to model that role of humility and service. We need to be faithful in marriage, faithfulness in marriage. The scriptures put it in terms of uh, being the husband of one wife, and I think the primary principle there is faithfulness in our marriage. And that needs to be modeled for people. I know that there are a lot of um, discussion about that, and we can hold that discussion on another time mm -hmm. about some of that. But uh, certainly the importance of being the role model for faithfulness in marriage and in fatherhood as well. But you, role, you, you model that for others. You may not have little ones at home right now, but uh, how you treat the little ones of the church how you model what it means to serve the children of the church as well as others. Uh, people will get that sense that you're modeling that role of fatherhood. And then being a responsible head of household. And then most important is to hold to the mystery of the faith. Because if you don't have that conviction that Peter had, that Jesus is the Christ and you're committed to that, and committed to that mystery of the gospel of Christ, how it is that someone who has completely been against God maybe their entire life can be saved and forgiven of that. That great mystery of how the gospel can bring salvation to them. If you're not 
aware of that personally in your life. If you haven't experienced that, if you're not modeling that mystery to others, we can't expect anyone else to follow along. So it is that you have to be willing to model that as well. And then you have to be tested. I would assume that if you were not tested, you would not have been approved. If people hadn't said, well, we've looked at how he lives, we've looked at how he serves, and we believe that he is worthy of being a deacon, you would not have been tested, but you have been. And so you have come before us to this point tonight, having that. And so we charge the church to be busy about being a healthy church, to be committed to the, the marks of being a healthy church, to come alongside each other in trying to help your church under God's leadership and Holy Spirit to be a healthy church. Be committed to that. And as a deacon, Paul, be committed alongside the people to having a healthy church, as well as to these things specifically that are addressed to you as a deacon. And as a deacon's wife, also, we find in verse 11, I repeat, dignified, not slanderers, but sober-minded, faithful in all things, committing yourself along with Paul to serve the church. And there's not a sense in which you're being ordained, uh, and no one's going to hold you accountable for the role of being a deacon, but as a deacon's wife, to also, to the degree possible, to serve alongside him in doing that and being this way. And so we come this evening to commit ourselves afresh and anew as a church to being a healthy church and to commit ourselves also to serving alongside our deacons in the functions of a healthy church. So I would ask you, church, are you willing to commit yourselves this evening afresh and anew to do your very best under God's power to be a healthy church? Where you commit yourselves to coming alongside Brother Paul and supporting him in his role of deacon to help you to be a healthy church. So we would ask you, Paul, if you are willing to commit yourself to come alongside the church to help them to be a healthy church and to commit yourself to these attributes and to the best of your ability with God's help to model these attributes of what it means to be a Christ-filled, God-led, Spirit-led deacon of this church. I will. On the basis of the church and the deacon and candidate's commitment to being a healthy church here in Galilee Missionary Baptist Church, we're going to ask you, Paul, if you will come and kneel before the church. And we're going to ask that catch. all of those who are ordained, either as clergy... Can, can I get you to come He said he could be down there uh, as long as he didn't have to be there too long. And we understand that. Uh, so those of you who are ordained either as clergy or as deacon are invited uh, to come and lay hands on Paul. We'll, we'll do that individually. Uh, I'd like to whisper a few things here and then maybe you could uh, individually as the Lord leads you. And then um, after you've done that, go back to your seats and I will as well. Uh, so we'll just spend a few moments now doing this. So,
want to uh, present to uh, Brother Paul this certificate of his ordination. Paul Leonard Pierre, having been chosen as a man of good report, full of the spirit and of wisdom, and capable of using the office well, was set apart publicly to the office and work of deacon, Galilee Missionary Baptist Church, and the address here, 26th day of January, 2022. And Brother Billy and I have signed this as a certificate of ordination, and we want to present that to you. And may, may it be that which will be a testimony to the world Thank you. Of, of your calling of your service here tonight. We're going to ask you to give a few words, if you will. That's a scary thought, isn't it? Um, a few <laughs> words. <laughs> so I guess the, the one thing, uh, I have the two-minute warning in back. Um, one thing I, I just want to reemphasize with all of us is really why are we here to glorify God, Amen. right? Amen. And I would ask uh, your help and that of the Holy Spirit as Jesus ascends on this church that he would empower myself, my wife, and all of us here that serve the Lord and that we take seriously the words above our entrance and exit. You are now entering the mission field. We come here to learn, and it's my prayer that as we leave, we would serve. I'd like to thank my wife for many years. April will be 40 years mm -hmm. um, to our anniversary. Mm -hmm. My children, of course, are all saved, and I look forward to a day in heaven when our whole family will be together again. We're spread across the United States right now. I would also commit to you that with the power of the Holy Spirit as it, as it rests on my shoulders uh, to do my very best in your behalf for you. My door is always open as it is to say, but so is my phone, my home. Um, you need to let me know. I'll do my very best to do or find what is needed with God's help and guidance and answering that need. I'd like to thank my associates, Pastor Joe, Brother Billy and Brother Carnell, and of course my brother Jay um, for their support. For your support, um, I, I'm gonna start uh, crying pretty quick, so I have to be quiet. <laughs> and and uh, thank you all very much for your confidence in me, and I just pray God will help me fulfill that confidence. Amen. 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 Yes, yes. Uh, we want to present you with a copy of Henry Webb's book, Deacons, Sort of Models in the Church. And for Miss Geneva, help, I'm a deacon's wife. Okay. okay. God bless you. Very nice. And after the service, I don't know, perhaps um, is there some fellowship or something you said? Yeah, we'll yeah, you'll have opportunity to extend a hand of fellowship and um, appreciation and congratulations uh, to uh, Brother Paul. Thank you. Okay, Thank, you. Thank you very much. All right, we got one more song coming up here. And you know, uh, I know why we gave it, why you picked this song, but you know, this song should be all of our, uh, our, our, our desires and our heartfelt uh, emotions because wherever he goes, that's where we gotta go. Mm -hmm. So here's the song, we just uh, picked this one up today, so pray for us. Please stand if you would. Long intro.
God, Lord, you said the name of the Lord is a strong tower. And you say the righteous can run into it and it's safe. Yes. You say we are to trust in the Lord with all our hearts and lean not to our own understanding. You say
But when you say we are to commit our thoughts unto the Lord and our ways shall be established. Dear Heavenly Father God, Lord, we thank you for everything that was done and said tonight. Thank you for Brother Joe, oh God, dear God, coming in, Lord, and stepping in and helping us, oh God, with this ordination service. And Lord, we pray that everything that was done here tonight, Lord, was done to, to give you the praise, the honor, and the glory. We realize, oh God, that without you, Lord, none of this could have been possible. Lord, I thank you for Brother Paul, Lord, stepping up, oh God, and being willing, oh God, to serve as a deacon. Yes. It's not an easy task, uh, as so many think. But Lord, we know that once we put our faith in you, we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. And dear God, I ask you to go with the people that came out tonight. Lord, I believe that everything that happens, oh God, happens for a reason. And I believe that it's because of you that everything takes place. Father God, I thank you for all these people that came out. We just want to take the time to lift them up. I ask you, oh God, to give them, please, the desires of their hearts tonight. Mm. And dear God, we ask you to please bless the food Oh God, that we are about to take part, take of love. And we ask you to bless it as nourishment for our bodies. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 amen.